today is, Christ, in the Christian calendar, in the Christian holiday, it's Trinity Sunday. If you weren't aware, Trinity Sunday, it's a day that we reflect on the Trinity, what it is, the mystery of it. It's kind of one of those deeper topics that, you know, theologians have struggled with for thousands of years now, trying to wrestle with what exactly it means and how we, how we can understand what the Trinity is. And I love, I love deep thoughts. I love deep conversations and, you know, getting real deep and sometimes getting a little weird with it. And, you know, me and my wife, sometimes we'll be talking late at night and having these conversations and talking about the mysteries of, of life, the mysteries of eternity, of, of God, just of all these cool things, the wonders of the universe. I, I, I just love all of that. And uh, just a couple months ago, me and my wife were talking, and we're talking literally about the Trinity. We're talking about God and three persons, and man, that's, you know, it's wild. It's really hard to wrap your head around, what, you know, three persons, what, is, what does that mean? And she said, well, you know, I just had this thought. She goes, we, we talk a lot about, you know, obviously we all understand that we are spirit, soul, and body. Like, we're comfortable with that idea. We're three in one, right? Spirit, soul, and body, and, and we're comfortable with that idea. Why, why doesn't that, why don't we just think of God like that? Which, obviously, we do, but the analogy is that, you know, God is the soul, the spirit is the Holy Spirit, and the body is Christ, amen? And I was like, whoa, Kaylin, that's, that's really cool. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that everybody knows that, but I hadn't heard that before, and I thought, you know, that is it's kind of a cool analogy on how to kind of wrap your head around God. I mean, if we're three in one, you know, God, we're created in his image, and he's three in one, Christ being the body, and the soul being God, and the spirit being the Holy Spirit, that's really neat. So here we are pondering this question, you know, the Trinity, how exactly does it work? How, what exactly, you know, what, what, what is the purpose? What, what, you know, does it really even matter to, to really understand it? Do, you know, it, we, we worship God, but does it matter that we fully understand the Trinity? So it's kind of fun to ponder these ideas and get deep sometimes with these and question. And, you know, God created us all with curiosity. It's a good thing to question. It's a good thing to be curious. Albert Einstein has a quote. He said, the important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend just a little of this mystery every day. Never lose a holy curiosity. I thought that was so cool. Albert Einstein, one of the smartest men of the last you know, couple hundred years, Albert Einstein. He says, never lose a holy curiosity. So don't ever be afraid to question. Don't ever be afraid to, you know, be curious about what does this mean? Why, why, is, this the, why is it the way we do the things that we do as Christians? It's good. It's good to question. And the Trinity is a great mystery to be explored. What is even the significance? Like I said earlier, what does it even matter really? I mean, we worship God. Isn't that good enough? Is it one God? Is it three gods? Is it Three distinct parts to one God. Is it three persons in one God? I, I guess I get a little confused there. You know, we're not going to figure this out with simple math, obviously. It's not a math equation. So we're going to, you know, the, the word itself isn't even in the Bible. Did you know that? Trinity, you'll never find that word even in the Bible. It's a concept that we have came up with on our own, which is fine. We, we do that a lot. We infer. But we came up with the word Trinity. To give that, to give the three God or the, the three parts in one God, to give that some meaning. But the fundamentals of the Trinity is that there are three persons. That's the fundamental point. There's three persons, and I think that alone, right there, can trip us up a little bit. Can get it a little, make it a little muddy, because in in our current culture, in, in modern day life, when we say person, we think of an individual unit, right? Like I'm a person. I am me. I am one. I mean, an individual. And as individuals, we tend to become isolated sometimes. And if, if you notice in modern life, man, isolation, it's, it's more and more, we become more and more isolated as we've gotten. Think about text messaging. Think about emails. Think about just the internet, right? It's, it's all pushing us away from each other and more secluded less personal and more isolated, right? Think about the last two years, the pandemic. Man, we were isolated for two years, deathly afraid of everybody six feet away, deathly afraid to get any closer than that to anybody for fear of, you know, what might happen. 
We're iso- we became isolated even more. And, and as, as, as we transgress more in the future, we just become, it seems to be more isolated. That's kind of modern, modern life. And if you're an introvert, that's great, I guess, for you, right? I mean, <laughs> but no, but God did. He created us to need each other. He created us for community, for communion. We, you know, there's that lie out there that, hey, man, you can do life on your own. You don't need anybody else. You're, all you need is you. You can make it through life on your own. But we know that's a lie. That's a lie as Christians. We know, I mean, just basic life, for life to come into existence, it takes two people, right? It takes a communion, a union of two people just to bring life into this world. And then to go on, if, you know, we are who we hang out with. We tell that to our kids. We are who we hang out with. We all know that. We, they, they, people's influence, our lives shape us and mold us into who we become. So it's so important to have others around us bringing us up, taking us through life, caring, you know, lifting us up through the difficult situations. We need each other. We need community. And the type of people we surround ourselves steers that entire course of our life. So we need each other. So we're talking about the Trinity this morning. The Trinity, it's three in one. They're, they're undivided. They're, they're completely in unity. And Brad Jersak, is, he's a modern-day theologian that I really respect, and he had something to say about the Trinity. People were asking him, and he made a big comment on it. He said, well, we always start with one. We don't have three gods. That's tritheism. How many gods? One. One nature, one essence, one substance, one being, One. And that divine essence is 100% love. There, there can be no inferiority in that oneness. Indeed, it's, it's more than the oneness of unity like you and I could enjoy. It's the oneness of an invisible union where all of the operations of the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, are without division. The one God is said to be triune and tripersonal. If God were a monad, which means one solitary person, he could not be love because he could only love himself, which isn't really love. God is love because Father, Son, and Spirit are self-giving, co-eternal, infinite love, forever sharing one divine nature. It is extremely difficult for us to imagine one divine being who is beyond being as also a divine community of persons. But so the scriptures and the church by the Spirit have revealed one God, one love revealed as the indivisible Father, Son, and Spirit, co-equal and co-eternal. Amen. I thought that was so good, but, he, you know, Brad there, he's a theologian, man. He, he goes a little deep with it. You know, it's a little tough sometimes for my Norwegian mind to wrap, it, wrap my head around that. But he continues, and he, he kind of dumbs it down a little bit. He says, hey, he says, let me give you an analogy. Our, our sun shines, and the sun and the sunshine share one essence, the light. Photons are photons. This, too, is a limited a- analogy, but it at least highlights how light equals light, even as the sun sends sunshine. And what do you know? This is exactly what Hebrew says. Christ is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. The being and the image are one. Jesus said to see me is to see the Father. Amen. So you can see, you know, even earlier when we, we were talking about how comparing the Trinity to even, uh, you know, us, spirit, soul, and body, which is a nice analogy because it kind of helps you wrap your head around the picture of it. But still, it's a, it's, that's even a little bit antiquated just in the terms of when we use us as an example, us as a person, we're always at conflict, right? Our human nature constantly at conflict, which is completely the opposite of God's nature. So even that isn't really a great you know, the, the, the right analogy in, in terms of the beauty and the greatness of God. But it, at least it's something to kind of help us, you know, get an image. But that's all we can do. That's how, even as theologians, they've wrestled with this idea for thousands of years, trying to figure out how do we explain this mystery? How, how can we really wrap our heads around? And, and the fact is we'll never really know. I, I don't think our human brains can conceive truly what that means as three persons, one being, one essence. But it's fun, it's fun to dig in and, and dive deep into this. Um, this is what we do know without question. God, the creator, being three in one in his everlasting love, desired to create beings in his image. He already had a community, Father, Son, and Spirit. They were already divinely loving over and over, continuing, continually in unity, co-eternal. 
But it says, God being the creator in his everlasting love desired to create beings in his image. The father sent his son and invites us to join in that community and live it out via our guide, the Holy Spirit. And further his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. God already had that community and now he extends it to us. John 3, 16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. And we all know that verse, we love it. But we sometimes skip over 17 and 18. Those are the best parts. 17 and 18, do you have 17 up there? It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn condemn the world, but to save save the world through him. That's good news. That's good news. He didn't come to condemn the world, right? He didn't come. The world is already condemned on its own because it's, it's, it's rejecting the love of God, the, own, the truly life-changing, life-giving love of God. It's rejecting that. It condemns itself. God didn't have to come to condemn them and say, you're evil, you're bad, you're condemned. I, you know, no, he didn't do that. He came to rescue and save the world. Amen. That's Jesus. G- yet, you know, his, his love remains unchanged whether or not we receive it. His love remains unchanged by our human response. We can reject it. His love remains the same. Our response cannot and will never change the Trinity. In God's very essence, just like Brad Jusak said, his very nature, there is nothing but love. And he invites us into that love, not, not in theory, not in theory, not in analogy, like we've been trying to give analogies to this Trinity, but in his very essence. Not only that, God is love in relationship. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Perfect love, perfect unity. And the more, we, the more we reflect on that love, this is why it's so important, because the more we reflect on it, the more we meditate and ponder on it, just like we're doing this morning, the more we are changed by it, the more we are transformed, like Paul would use the word, transformed by it, so that we can propagate it to the rest of this world. And that's what we are practicing right here today learning about it, meditating on it. We all know, man, violence begets violence, begets violence. It's an endless cycle. And it takes one person, just takes one person to stand up in an ultimate sacrifice on the cross. It took one person to say, no, this is it. This stops here. I forgive. He poured out his forgiveness on the entire world, stopping that endless cycle. But we have to receive that, amen? Amen. We have to be willing to accept that into our life. But it takes someone willing to take a stand, to change, to forgive. Man, this culture that we're in, we're we're just inundated with violence. Every day in the news, violence, more violence, more violence. Inundated with it. We're formed by this culture of violence. Hatred, disunity. Our culture, have you heard the term us versus them? Have you, anybody heard that, culture, that term, us versus them? That's the culture we live in is this us versus them culture. I'm right, you're wrong, I'm good, you're evil. That's all it is, us versus them, everything. We, we were born into it. We were born into, uh, d- pick a side. Go with it, stick with them because the other guys are wrong. They're evil, they're bad, Every, everything. You know, it's all tribal. Have you heard... Uh, Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all tribal. Sorry, I got to catch back up on my notes here. The us versus them, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm good, you're evil. From sports to politics to families to genders to nations to borders to religions to even Christianity. Even Christianity got sucked into this horrible us versus them culture. You think about all the different sects of Christianity where Catholics, Lutherans, Baptists, Evangelicals, Protestants, it just keeps going on and on. Why? Because it was all essentially birthed out of division, out of us versus them, out of I'm right, you're wrong. Instead of just focusing on the fundamentals, focusing on Jesus, we get caught up in this us versus them mentality. Did you know that the name Satan is literally translates to the accuser, the accuser. Every time we practice in this us versus them culture, pointing our finger, accusing, blaming, scapegoating, they're the problem. Every time we do that, we're practicing, we are taking part in that spirit of Satan, the antichrist spirit. Every time, us versus them. And that is the culture of this world. 
Think about that just for a moment. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Trinity in its perfect union, compared that to the Spirit of this world. Everything's division. Everything's disunity. We can easily fall into that trap as Christians. Easily. Have you, have, we, we've, we've all heard the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin. You gotta love the sinner, you gotta hate the sin. And that's, that's I mean, I agree, man. We, we, love, we love the sinner. And where do we get that from? Get that from Jesus. Jesus taught us that. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. Man, you know, it's, it, it can be just to hate sin in your life because you, you, know, you know just how it's, it's so damaging. It's so, so you know, horrible. So, it's so, it so tears you apart from God so much that you just want to get rid of it in your life so you hate it. But sometimes, you know, hate. We, in our household for, for years, we banned the word hate. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't say hate. So any, I would actually slip up and Apollo would be like, Dad, that's a naughty word. You can't say hate. <laughs> Because it, it really, you know, it's, it's not a word we want in our vocabulary. We don't hate anything. But hate, you know, you start, he's saying, yeah, I love God, or lo- love the sinner, I hate the sin. So often as Christians, we take that and we say, yeah, I hate the sin, that's good, okay, I hate that sin. Man, that sin's disgusting. Man, oh, I can't believe they do that. Oh, that's so sick, that's disgusting. That sin, that hate, that disgust turns into the person and it spills over into them. And I've watched it time and time again, Christians, that hate of the sin spilling into the sinner. And we have to be so careful that we don't see people like that. We don't hate the sin in the, we don't, and, and let that allow us to change our view of the person, of the sinner. We just love to pick on certain sins, right? We, there's always two or three in pop culture in any relevant time that, you know, we just love to point out those two or three. Those are the bad ones. Those are the disgusting ones. Man, I'm, I can't believe that Christian over there does that, right? We, we, have, we have the hot topic ones of the day. We just love to pick on those. Yeah, I might struggle with a little sin in my life. It's just a little bit of gossip I deal with. Yeah, you know, I told a lie at work. It was actually kind of funny. It was, it was funny how it played out, you know, but you know, it didn't hurt anybody. I told a little lie. You know, we, we point our finger at all these other people. Meanwhile, we're drowning in our own vat of sin. And we don't even see that. It's just too easy for that hate to spill over into the person if we're not careful. I'll give you a perfect example. As I was preparing this message, a couple days ago, this article popped up in my, in my news feed, and it was from NBC News. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to go through a couple parts. Here's the actual quote. This is a pastor, in, a Baptist pastor in Texas, and we're just talking about how hating the sinner, or loving the sinner, hating the sin can turn into something awful if we're not careful. Says the pastor in Texas says, I'm angry this morning because our entire country is celebrating the worst sin in the Bible. This pastor was saying this during the sermon uh, referring to Pride Month, which commemorates the LGBTQ, the LGBTQ community. He said, I'm angry this morning because our entire country is celebrating this sin. He said, you know, a lot of pastors have this stupid idea where it's just like, you know, you know, God loves everyone and hates the sin but loves the sinner. But people have taken this to such an extreme where they're saying, celebrate the sin. He goes on to, I'm not going to continue with what he says and some of these other parts. It's it's really awful. But he ends with, and this is quote, these people should be put to death. Every single homosexual in our country should be charged with a crime. They should be lined up against the wall and shot in the back of the head. This is from a pulpit last week, a Baptist church, a A preacher standing up, telling his congregation that these people should be shot in the back of the head. And he said they have no hope for salvation. He said they have no hope for salvation. This is what we can get to if we're not careful. If we don't rightly divide the word in context, like Pastor always says, drills that over to us. Man, you got to read the Bible in context and you'll never get off. This is an example of getting off. It's really easy to get in the Bible and just read one verse without context and you can make it say just about anything. Justify just about anything. And if you agree with that pastor, I, I hope and I don't think any of you do, but if you even sympathize a little bit with it, this line of thinking, you need to get back into the word and read about Jesus. Read what he says because in light of Jesus, in light of Jesus, 
This is objectively wrong. It's an example of calling good evil and evil good. It's how we can go from loving the sinner and hating the sin to hating the sinner now and let's kill him. It's a slippery slope that Jesus knew all too well. He knew it all too well. And pastor preached just a couple, two or three weeks ago on uh, the, the woman that caught, was caught in adultery. You guys remember that? He's, literally, this woman is caught, it says, the Bible says, caught in the act. She's caught in the act of sin, right? So what do they do? The Jews bring her to Jesus and they say, Jesus, what should we do? Let's stone her. We got to stone her, right? They were literally doing what their Bible, their holy book said to do, that God command. At that time, they thought. They were literally doing it. This is right, man. Hey, according to the Torah, Jesus, here's a stone, buddy. We got to do it. But what did Jesus say? He said, he who has no sin cast the first stone. He who has no sin cast the first stone. What a powerful, literally world-changing moment. Jesus shut down an entire group of of violent passages from the Torah. Shuts it down in nine words. He who has no sin cast the first stone. We're all sinners. But the example of this pastor is what can happen when we take the Holy Scriptures and misread them. Without, without Jesus, without the light of Jesus, without the full revelation of him, we can easily do that. We can easily go into the Old Testament and come up with all kinds of crazy ideas that was never God in the first place. They just had it wrong. They, they didn't have the full revelation of Jesus like we do today, the full revelation of the Trinity, which is why the Trinity is so important to our faith, because it reveals that Jesus is what God has to say. Instead of hating the sinner's sin, and I'm talking the sinner's sin, because that's what sinners do, instead of hating it, maybe try to understand it. Because in, you know, in understanding why they are doing what they're doing, we might be able to f- just find an ounce of compassion there for them. Because what if that was you in their shoes? That word for that is empathy, putting your place in their shoes. What if that was me? Instead of, I can't believe they do that, what if it's more like, man, I, I get why they're, I, get, I understand why they're there. I was there once. Or, man, I could be there too. And have compassion for the person. When we see others as us and not them, when we see them as us and not them in another body, we, we can't help but have compassion. Until we realize it's not an us versus them, but really it's us It's just us versus us. You will never be able to have true empathy for others. That person you see doing the thing that you hate so much is quite possibly exactly where you would be had you trekked that same path they did, had you experienced the same things they had to go through. It's very possible. Until we realize that, we'll never truly have empathy for them. They are you just having walked a different path, having experienced different experiences in life. But the good news is that God is not hate. God is not anger. God is not wrath. God is love, 100%. It's his essence. He's never at odds with himself. There's no disunity. There's no division. There's never two of them in the corner talking bad about the other guy. God and the Holy Spirit. Man, Holy Spirit, get over here. You see Jesus? I sent him to earth. You see that guy he just forgave? He, with, I mean... Without anything, you just forgave him. All the mercy he's thrown out, what, what the heck? Gee, holy, we, hey, let's go back. I know, man, let's, let's have a little good time. Let's go back to the Old Testament days. Let's, let's do some old-fashioned smiting, God, or Holy Spirit. Let's do it. Remember that number we did on the Philistines? Man, those are the good old days, right? But that's not the case. There is no division, no disunity in the Trinity. Only perfect uni, unity, only perfect love. Paul said it in Romans, every time we judge, we're being judged. Every time we despise, we are only being despised ourselves and continuing that cycle of hate. So how do we view God? 
in these days, what, you know, what is God like? I mean, I've definitely pondered that question, you know, because I would love to have a full revelation of him sometime, you know, just like in a story I'm about to tell. But, I, you know, how do we really know? What, what exactly is God like? And that's the purpose of the Trinity. That is why Jesus came. Jesus did not come to, church, to, come to earth to change God's mind about us. Jesus came to earth to change our mind about God. I'll say that again. Jesus didn't come to earth to change God's mind about us. You know, he didn't die just to appease God's wrath that God was just waiting to pour out. He couldn't hardly wait. He died to change our mind about God. And you see, we called him vengeful. We abused his name in violence. We looked at other cultures around at that time and, and saw what they, the gods they worshipped, and we thought our God, Jehovah, should be the same nature as them. We got it wrong. We got off. Jesus came to set the course right. I'm Christian because I follow Christ. I'm not a Mosian. <laughs> I don't follow Moses. I'm not a Davidian. I'm a Christian because I follow Christ. I'm not an Elijian. Those are all good people, all good, I mean, amazing people of God, but I'm a Christian because I follow Christ. I have a Bible which told me a story of a world so diseased with sin, so diseased with violence, that God had no choice. His last resort, the only choice was to send his son to finally reveal, man, guys, you're on the right track, but oh, man, I took a lot longer than I thought it would. Here is my son. And I'm going to have him show you the way. Reveal my heart to you. And even today, some Christians don't have this revelation. And they say, Jesus is God. Yeah, of course, we love Jesus. I'm a Christian. But then we use other things in the Bible. Other, you know, we misquote, we abuse, and we use those verses to trump what Jesus had to say. And we can't do that as Christians. We are Christians. We are Christ followers, being Christ-like, made in his image, and we have to follow him. John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Jesus, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Jesus. Jesus is the word of God, the word with a capital W. Jesus is the word. And in Matthew 17.1, we can turn there. Matthew 17, 1, Jesus of the Trinity is the word of God. He is what God has to say. I'm going to actually start the last verse of 16. Um, this was after Jesus predicts his death to the disciples. He said, truly I tell you, some who are standing here right now will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then chapter 17, it says, six days later, three of them saw that glory. Can you imagine? Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance, Jesus, Jesus, his appearance changed from the inside out right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes filled with light. It kind of reminds me of that analogy that Brad said about, you know, the, the Trinity being like sun and sunshine and the rays of the sun. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light, the light of God. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. Another deep convo. Wouldn't that be fun to know what they were talking about? Peter broke in. Master, this is a great moment. What, what would you think if I, built, if I built three memorials here on the mountain? One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. What a great idea. See, Moses and Elijah, to them, was their was their religious figures, their religious fathers in the faith. They were the ones that they looked up to, that they gleaned all of their wisdom from. They were the, the holy fathers, reverent fathers of the faith, and they thought, hey, Jesus, you're great. Hey, Elijah and Moses, let's, let's all build an altar to all three of them. Wouldn't that be awesome? What happens? It says, verse 5, while he was going on like this, Peter, <laughs> babbling, I love that, a light, radiant cloud enveloped them, and sounding from deep in the cloud a voice, this is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight. Listen to him. 
See, I think that should be bold, and I think that should be maybe all uppercase in the Bible, because I think, I don't think it was, listen to him, I think God was maybe a little annoyed right now. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. He said, don't be afraid. And this is the best part. When they opened their eyes and looked around, they saw Jesus, only Jesus. While they are concerned with building altars to Moses and Elijah, God is literally saying to them, they are not the focus anymore. He is. Listen to his words. Not theirs, his. And I, don't get me wrong, don't take this for a second. I'm not saying we shouldn't be studying what they had to say because we can glean all kinds of great, rich you know, stories and nuggets from the Old Testament and from their stories, but they did not have the full revelation of Jesus. They just simply did not until this moment. And just like them, we build our altars too. We build our altars to our popular figures in the world, our Christian popular figures, listen to what they have to say. We build altars to politics. We build altars to the luxuries of life. God is saying, listen to him. Listen to my son. Eugene Peterson, he's another theologian that somewhat recently passed away, but he's the author of the Message Bible an awesome translation. He said, he had a commentary on the transfiguration and he said, what happens to Jesus happens to us. Jesus was transfigured before the disciples' eyes. One possible translation of the Greek word is metamorphosed. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it's rendered transformed. In other words, the reality that was inside of Jesus got outside of him so the disciples could see it. Not only was this true of Jesus, it's true of you and me. Paul wrote about it in his letters to Romans. He said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Or as I translated it, be changed from the inside out. The same Greek word that's used to describe Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew is used in Romans to describe our transfiguration. What happens to Jesus happens to us. But it happens to us by renewing our minds. As we listen to him, as we look to him, as we linger with him, a transformation occurs and the beauty that is his ways become ours. That's Eugene Peterson. So as we meditate on Jesus and his teachings, man, we we start to become transformed and more like him each day. And as we listen, we go to church like this and listen about the love of God, we become become more transformed, metamorphous into an image more like him, able to bring hope to this hopeless world, able to bring peace to a world filled with violence, able to bring love to those hurting around us. But we can't do it without Jesus. We can't do it without his guide, the Holy Spirit, without his help. It's impossible. I mean, just in our human nature, like I said earlier, just inside ourselves, we're constantly at war, constantly in, at odds with ourselves. The last thing I'll say, I'll leave one last little comment here. When, when Jesus was being put on trial, he, uh, the Jews were given an option. They, they were given an option to release one prisoner at the time. Jesus was one of the options. And the Jews, obviously mad at Jesus because he's supposed to be the Messiah, but he's not quite the Messiah they were expecting because they were expecting a Messiah that would come back in a vengeful way and and take over the enemies, give them victory over their enemies, conquer. That's what they were expecting. If you don't know that, read your Bible. (laughs) But that's what they were expecting, a Messiah to come back, a warmongering Messiah. So they had an option, and they said, hey, Barnabas is up there too. He's an option. We want Barnabas. Barnabas, yes, give us Barnabas back. That's the guy we want. Well, who was Barnabas? Barnabas was in prison for the very thing they wanted. He was in prison for inciting an insurrection against the Roman Empire. That was Barnabas. The very thing that they wanted in their Messiah. So what do they do? They pick. 
They pick Barnabas. They pick an insurrectionist. They pick an insurrection over the resurrection. They pick a king of, a king of thieves over the king of kings. And I, I just ask, you know, do we recognize the Messiah? They, they didn't. How do we view him? How, are we, how do we see the Messiah? Do we recognize who he truly is? Jesus, the Trinity, three in one, perfect love, no division. That's the God we worship. Before creation, throughout creation, Old Testament times, New Testament times, end times, God is always and only love. It's his nature. It's his essence. It's a love that's not selfish, but a love that gives. It's a love that always is going to require sacrifice. So in context, it makes a lot of, it makes a lot of sense when, God said, when Jesus said, hey, the two most important commandments, love your God and love your neighbor. Community, love your God and love your neighbor. You can't experience true agape love without other people. It's always focused outward on others. And in an act of, ultimate act of divine love, Jesus stood on that cross, hung on that cross, extending out his arms, showing us the way to true life, sacrifice, giving up your life, forgiving, pouring out his forgiveness onto the world, ending the cycle of violence, of revenge, of hate, in one grand swoop, hanging on that cross, and he's still holding those arms out today, inviting us all to join in that community, to join in that love, to join in that peace. Everything works perfectly for the good when we're in perfect unity, amen? So God is inviting you, he's welcoming you, and wants to give you a new life, a better way to live, amen. Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart, and Jesus, I make you Lord of my life, and I thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Make sure you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Open your Bible and read it daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surround yourself with godly friends that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We trust that you are encouraged, strengthened, and are ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he is for you, not against you. We love you. We are praying for you and your family. We'll see you next time.